kind of curious. You had a lot of guns on set, and we know that we've had this gun issue yeah. all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. You had a lot of weapons. Um, so many. So, so what is your take on, you know, this the Alec Baldwin issue on set, you know, unfortunate, uh, you know, shooting? You know, it it it's so sad. Um, well, coincidentally, I had literally just wrapped a movie opposite Billy Bobbin. Right. And I had learned through our conversations, obviously how close that family is and how much they love one another. And, um, and I've always admired the Baldwins a great deal. I think that they're all great talents and have so much character and are so brilliant. And I've got to say, working with Billy was, was such a privilege. He's such a nice, kind man and, um, a, a very loving family man. And we've stayed in touch. Um, so it's sort of, as we had just met and just worked together, it really, I thought, you know, this tragedy impacts so, so many people. Um, you know, everyone that was on that set will remember that always. And, and, and sadly for Alec, obviously he's going to wake up every morning for the rest of his life and, and realize that this tragic event occurred and that's going to make him very sad. And it's going to make his family very sad. And obviously, um, you know, the, 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 the family of the uh, cinematographer have lost an extraordinary woman and a mother. And it's, I don't know how it happened. I don't know how it happened because on any set that I've ever been on, including the one, by the way, with, um, with Billy, we had, we had weapons on set, but typically um, the assistant director and the weapons master and armorer will say, you know, quiet on the set. Um, they'll pit, they'll hold the weapon and they'll say this is they'll announce what it is whether it's real or whether it's fake and they will give everyone an opportunity to examine the weapon and to look and make sure that they feel safe um, having this particular weapon on set mm-hmm. and this is I mean in my movie we had a chainsaw we had a hedge trimmer we had <laughs> we had glass breaking um, curling irons flying I had nunchucks I had a crossbow, um, a, a yeah. sword. The sword actually ended up on the cutting room floor, sadly. Um, I mean, I actually literally can't list all the weapons that we had. We had so, so, so many. But in every single event, even with a silly curling iron, my props and weapons master and assistant director would announce to the set, you know, the actress will be holding this item. It will be swinging in the air. Please step off the set. Please move to a, a distance that's safe. Um, and so I, you know, I, I just don't know how, I just don't know how that happened. It, it, it's totally mystifying to me. And as an actress, every time that I've been on a set with weapons, I, I mean, it's, it's nerve wracking having a gun pointed at you, even if you know that the gun is not even real. Mm-hmm. And um, I know you know this obviously with your history oh, yeah. in the military. Yeah. You've probably been up. You've obviously had a huge amount of experience with weapons. But um, on on the film that I did just finished um, called Out of Hand with Pearson Bode and Billy Baldwin, uh, there was a scene where I had a gun pointed at my head, and they stopped and they said, "Listen, everybody, you have an opportunity to look at this. This is not a real weapon. It's fake. It doesn't. It doesn't operate. There is no." there is no bullets. There's nothing in this thing. And I, even though I've been told that I really wanted an opportunity to look at it myself. And that's, that's typical, that's normal. So something, obviously it seems as though they were, um, they were rushing and there were crew issues and everything else, but what a tragedy. It just, it, it's certainly shaken the entire business. Um, and I think that, you know, these accidents do happen. Actually, the uh, weapons master on my film um, that I just finished had a huge amount of experience. And he's sort of, I think, in his 60s and has been doing this for 40 years. And I texted him and I said, how does this happen? Like, how could this have happened? And he said, well, don't forget, I got shot in the face 30 years ago and he still has bits of, but you don't really hear about it. If stunt people get injured, you hear about it. If actors and you know cinematographers get injured and it's i think that it's it's certainly people will be practicing a lot more safety on set going forward as they should and i think it's just sad for for everybody that whole situation yeah yeah i'm with you there's some points you brought up that i agree with one pointing a gun at someone even for us in training if you don't feel like that is fucking strange or weird 
then you, you probably just you, you've never done it because right. there, I don't I don't know a seal that even in training where you go for you know, there's a moment even though you know it's simunitions you know that you've done all the safety briefs and you've gone through and everyone has checked every single weapon and you make sure there's not a live round anywhere in sight or even near where you're using simunitions or you know you know basically these little paint bullets paint right. rounds um, it still feels wrong when you're doing in training i mean you're doing it because it's going to make you better and you you want you want real people on the receiving end and real people shooting back at you because that's what's going to make you better in combat um but there's not a there's not an operator on the planet that won't tell you that it's when it's your own guys and you're doing it like that it still feels a little bit odd pointing that gun downrange at someone that's your that's your buddy <laughs> it, it really does yeah. actually and as an actress obviously even in me madness there's a scene where, you know, and you see it very commonly in film where the, the person pointing the weapon is pointing it toward the lens. And, and, and that happens also in Me Madness. So it explains, you know, you know, possibly how um, the, the cinematographer and the director were hit because obviously they were next to the lens. Um, but I felt very uncomfortable pointing the, the fake gun um, in, in me madness at Ed Westwick. And obviously he had an opportunity to look at the weapon and to know that there was nothing in it. And, um, it's crazy, but on that topic, I, I feel like your listeners don't get enough of an opportunity to hear a little bit about you. And I really, <laughs> I feel like I've listened to, I've listened to, uh, you know, your show and I, mm -hmm. and I think, I think actually your audience would really appreciate learning just a tiny bit about what it was like being a seal. <laughs> Come on, give us, some, um, give us a couple. No, of it was uh, like, yeah, okay. My my experience was uh, was pretty unique. It was cool. I got to you know, and I went through Bud's class two hundred three, which uh, you know was in ninety six ish, and then went to SEAL Team three, and got to spend time at the NSA, and then finished my career on the East Coast at uh, Development Group. You know, and uh, anyway, it was. Uh, I got lucky. I got to do the combat thing, but I also got to do more of the clandestine covert side of the house, pretty much an even split. Um, and it's the last part of my career most people are interested in. Unfortunately, you know, I can't really get into the details of it, but all classified. I, well, I, I, you know, what's funny is when I, when I built the right kind of crazy, um, and I, I too used a little bit of the American psycho kind of stuff to build the right kind of crazy <laughs> um, because I feel like that's what you need in order to, you know, kind of go into special operations anyway. But um, they, the beauty of it is the government redacted a hundred pages and that's a lot when you, when you write a book. I mean, we had to basically do a complete rewrite uh once we got the manuscript back from the pentagon and they sat on the on that manuscript for a year and then uh when we finally got it back you know we were able to still turn it into something is this um, is this a hundred deadly skills no no that's th that book those books actually did really well the right kind of crazy uh, which i'm is gonna more go and a... <laughs> yeah so 100 deadly can, skills so i can put them in my next movie in my in my uh in my uh Next, there you go. Next, next Captain Black sequel. <laughs> Dude, that would be awesome. I, actually, I'll just send you some if you want them. But uh, <laughs> the um, yeah. The, anyway, the book is great because it kind of tells you all this stuff. But then you see the redacted. I left all the redacted crap in there so that people could then kind of piecemeal, you know, what I did later, kind of together. But yeah, that's that's it in a nutshell. So there you go, listeners. Uh, at the request of. Uh, Lewis Linton, we uh we got it we got some uh, Clint stuff in there. <laughs> I love it. It's fascinating. You're listening to Can You Survive This Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Please make sure to subscribe, rate, and share on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. <laughs>